Um, but uh, yeah, we can start our own mentor, uh, fundraising for uh, mentoring in rural areas of Colorado. It's going to be a really specific group, and I'm guessing our, our key listeners are already online. So uh, not sure. Yeah, how I think so. Well, we'll give people a few more minutes to, to join us. I'll pop up on my screen. Um, the uh, I'll show you my screen. And actually, uh, we, we did a, a call with our AmeriCorps members last week, and we used webcam. And I was like, wow, it, it really changes the conversation for, for people to see each other while they're talking. And I'm in no condition right now to, to share myself. But um, if other people want to share yourselves on webcam, feel free to, to join in and do that. All right, so I would love to understand who's on the call um, before we get started. Um, so maybe if we could just introduce yourself, say what organization you're with and what town you're in. I think, you know, if we do this a few few ways, then at least when we have the summit and you say, oh, it's Anita, oh, Anita, I know you from the calls, um, so that people get to know each other a little bit better. And then even if you are uh, speaking, just to make it easier for everyone else, if you can say, uh, this is Anita, and say what you want to say while you're talking, and that way we can get to know each other's voices a little bit better, and people can get to know each other a little bit better. So I'm going to call out your name, and if your name is not listed, I will call out the caller number, and hopefully if you can figure out what caller number you are, then then great, and if not, then we'll just get people introducing yourself. So Anita, do you want to kick us off? Name, uh, what, what organization you're with, and the location? Sure. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, good morning everybody. I'm Anita Carpenter. I'm the executive director for Big Brothers Big Sisters Southwest Colorado. That's uh, where our home base is in Durango. Great, thanks Anita. Blake, you're the second on my list there. Yep, I'm in from Mesa County Partners in Grand Junction. Great, thanks Blake. Um, and then I've got a caller number two. All right, we'll go down. We'll go down to the caller numbers at the end. Let's see who other names. Curtis. Yeah, this is Curtis. Uh, I'm the executive director of Partners Mentoring, and we serve Delta, Montrose, and Uray. Great, thanks, Curtis. Maggie. Yeah, hi. This is Maggie Tevald. I'm the Early Childhood Programs and Youth Programs Coordinator at the Pinion Project uh, Family Resource Center in the southwest corner, um, Cortez, Colorado. Nice. Michelle? Michelle Pedix, Executive Director, Partners in Route County. Perfect. Michaela? Hi, I'm Michaela Curtis with Eagle River Youth Coalition in Eagle County. Great. Right. Seth? Uh, Seth Ehrlich, uh, Executive Director with SOS Outreach uh, based in Eagle County. Thanks, Seth. Shauna? This is Shauna Gogolin with Mountain Mentors in Summit County, Colorado. And Tina? Yeah, Tina McGinnis with Gunnison Valley Mentors in Gunnison. Great, and we have Vivian. Hi, Vivian Russell, co-executive director with True North Youth Program based in Telluride, Colorado, but we certainly are working on serving the watershed. Um, so into Norwood in the west of our county. Great, and then uh, Lindsay? Just name, organization, Hi, and, yeah, sorry. Okay, Lindsay LaFaro, um, I'm the executive director of the Buddy Program, and we serve kids from Aspen to Carbondale in the Roaring Fork Valley. Great, and then uh, we've got a couple of people who I, I can't tell who your name are, so if maybe just people want to jump in and introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Jan Lockard, and I'm from the Morgan County Interagency Oversight Group in Fort Morgan. Hey, Jen. Hi. Um, anyone else who hasn't introduced themselves? I think we, I heard somebody, yep. Um, I'm also serving in the morning, morning County and Walk County area. Um, it's students with disabilities ages 16 to 24. Uh, sorry, can you repeat your name again? It cut out a little bit there. You bet. Um, Sean Rosati. Oh, okay, Sean. Thanks. Thank you. And was there anyone else? 
All right, going once, going twice. Okay, um, so we're going to get started. Um, basically, this conversation started, I think, with uh, Mountain Mentors, as well as with um, Full Circle in Lake County. Am I saying that right? Is Alice on? Full Circle in Lake County, I believe I'm saying it right. Um, and uh, as well as Chafee County and others that have recognized that there's a need to talk about fundraising for mentoring in rural Colorado. Um, and just generally to bring together people who are working in rural Colorado uh, to talk a little bit about what's going on. The focus of this conversation is around fundraising, but um, you know, I find with these collaborations or with these interactions, if they're able to spin off into other areas, even better. Um, so. Based on our first conversation, we brought together a number of different people and talked a little bit about the different areas that we could focus on as a group. Um, with that conversation, and this is kind of what we're going to talk about today, with that conversation, I sent out an email and I had nine different areas that people spoke about. And they said, these are the areas that we could come together and, and kind of join forces and address. Uh, anywhere from just quarterly meetings, monthly meetings, to partnerships, to fan, uh, fundraising committees, to advocacy efforts, to uh, to a variety of different things. And so after our last meeting, what we had done was just send out a quick survey to people and say, what are you interested in doing? Um, and you can see the results here. Uh, on the right, you'll see how many people responded yes to the items uh, listed from one to nine. Um, as you can see, that's why we've set a quarterly meeting. A lot of people said, yeah, we'd like to sit down and, or sit down or, yeah, I guess sit, at, sit down at our computers and come together as a group and talk about fundraising in, um, in rural Colorado. And so that's basically what we, we did. I tried to take some of the other topics that were ticked as either a yes and include them into this quarterly meeting. Uh, again, you know, we only have a limited amount of time. We couldn't include everything. So, um, Based on the discussions, I've included, um, so today we're going to talk a little bit more about resources and some of the other resources that have come up uh, with the support of Mi Michaela from Eagle River Youth Coalition. Uh, we'll also talk about the possibility of block funding for rural mentoring agencies. Uh, I also talked to ask Tina and Seth to talk a little bit about what they're doing for fundraising. Um, just to get a few examples, I think uh, what we've always found with Mentor Colorado and the partnership is that uh, it's always valuable to have mentoring agencies sharing what they're doing and what they feel like are some best practices in certain areas. Um, and one of the other topics that came up in our last meeting that I thought was a easy low-hanging fruit was to ask Michelle and Lindsay just to talk about the local tax that's been created in, in Route County as well as Pic Picton County um, and how that's benefited organizations in their region um, and then we can talk about next steps and really these quarterly calls what I was thinking is at the end of the quarterly call um, we look at the discussions the topics that came up throughout the call and but also ask people what do you want to talk about next quarter who can I bring in to talk I was hoping to have Christy from TGYS uh, attend today but she was unable to participate in this meeting but she has expressed an interest in participating in, in some of these conversations to talk about how can TGYS funding be more equitable for rural agencies. And uh, I'll, she's, she shared a blurb with me that I haven't put up here on our survey, but I'll forward that to the group so you can see what TGYS is thinking in terms of how they can, and actually we can, I can cut and paste it while we're on the call, uh, so that people can see what TGYS is thinking in terms of uh, being more supportive to rural agencies in the state. All right, so I'm going to actually leave everybody, because there's not a lot of background noise, I'm going to leave everybody unmuted. Um, so if you do have questions or comments, feel free to jump in. I do want this to be more of a conversation. Um, for those people who are new to Metro Colorado, we are a collaboration of 65 plus organizations throughout the state that are trying to increase the number of quality mentoring relationships for young people. Um, and a lot of times our work isn't done necessarily by Mentor Colorado, but it's done by the organizations that have come together and said, we want to create this movement around mentoring. And, you know, Mentor Colorado or myself is not coming into this saying I'm the expert in fundraising or I'm the expert in, in rural Colorado, which I'm definitely not. Um, but we just wanted to support the conversation and help to further the conversation. So we are really looking for people on this call to contribute to the conversation. Um, with questions, with ideas, with comments to make sure it's a, 
a really rich experience for everyone uh, attending. Um, so uh, we'll move ahead with our agenda. You see the survey results there. Did anyone want to weigh in or comment on any of these and felt like, no, this is an area we really should be focusing on as a group? So we are really looking Brad, at... This, yep. is, this is Jan, and um, I didn't know that this was going to be um, something that we could see on screen, so I don't have access to that. Okay, so I'll try to be more descriptive. Um, um, so, and if you look at our... I don't know if you have... Are you in front of a computer right now, Jan? Yes, I can get to something if you have the information on how to get me there. Yeah, so if you go to our web... If you go to the link, you should be able to open up Go to Meeting. And if you go to the link on the meeting invite, you should be able to open up a screen. I, I would just, as I'm talking, if you if you want to just try and play with it and I, see. I didn't get a meeting invite, so. Uh, okay, here, let me send that to you right now and everybody can watch <laughs> while I send Jan. Jan. Thank you, I'm sorry, everybody. Oh, no, you're all good. This is, does anyone okay, else? Need, you're does good. Anyone, does anyone else need the link? I do. Um, Jan, all right. Okay, so Jan, you should get the, the link, and then... Um, okay, I'm looking for it. And then feel free to log in and let me know if you're having trouble with that. Okay, thank you. Um, so if, any, you I, know, if anyone wants to weigh in, and I don't think this is like a set conversation in that we're not going to address any of the other nine areas, or we're not going to look at other areas or come back to these, I think this is something we can visit on a on a... Uh, you know, on a quarterly basis, but you know, I think the evaluation tools we can look at um, what's already out there and what exists. So for our next meeting, if people have an interest, we can talk more about number two, the evaluation tools, and even the regional partnerships. We can get some examples of the what's already happening in terms of regional partnerships and have somebody present on their regional partnership. Um, so basically, I'm looking at this list uh, for this conversation. I looked at the low-hanging fruit and said, what can I pull together for November's meeting? But our meeting will happen every three months, and I'll start looking at what other areas can I address. And if you do have any ideas, or if people are willing to present on something that they think will be valuable for the group, uh, please let me know. Okay. So uh, resources that came up, and this is, uh, Michaela, feel free to jump in. Um, Michaela had sent me this on the Colorado Nonprofit Association. There's a... Uh, a conference happening um, quit, on uh, November 29th. Sorry, I don't see the date there yet. No, November 29th. Yeah. And, and Michaela, do you want to add a little bit to this? Um, sure. Yep. It's um, we're calling it the Western Slope Nonprofit Summit. Um, and it's uh, two different presenters that will be coming uh, to CMT and Edwards and talking about um, building a culture of philanthropy. Um, and uh, building a sustaining relationship through gratitude. So I'm really focused on the um, fundraising and, and the donor um, side of fundraising. Great. So in addition, on the follow-up for this meeting, and uh, I will be sending the TGYS response from Christy, as well as a link to this. So if people are interested in learning more, they'll have access to that information. I'll also be sending this PowerPoint um, with the with that email so that everyone has access to all of this information. Okay. Uh, the other thing is, uh, Michaela set up a conversation with uh, Leah. I'm, I'm trying to remember her last name, Michaela. Oh, I am spacing on it too right now. Oh, uh, it's okay. Um, from the CRC, the Community Resource Center. And we asked them, um, what are some strategies or what are some best practices in fundraising for rural, uh, rural America or rural Colorado? And, you know, they had, from, from my search and from talking to other people, they had reiterated the same thing is that there isn't a lot out there. There's not a lot of toolkits or resources or uh, information about what are the best practices. It really is just coming from the field and the sector. But they had uh, identified two things that they thought would be a good return on investment for Mentor Colorado. Uh, they said, if you really want to help support uh, and this was Leah from the CRC, if you want to help support rural agencies with fundraising, um, VISTA members through the CRC could potentially provide that support. And so what we talked about and we played around with the idea of having a cohort of VISTA members that support a variety of regions uh, in rural Colorado 
and they do focus on the fundraising, marketing, and communications piece, and that Mentor Colorado could potentially bring all these VISTA members together, train them, provide training from mentor, from marketing agencies, from sales agencies, and allow them to understand some of the best practices that are out there, and then have them go out and work with mentoring agency and be an extra set of hands to support their marketing communications and fundraising efforts. Uh, we talked about you know providing VISTAs for individual agencies, but also providing them for uh, regions so that they could support multiple agencies, uh, whether it's the southwestern region or the uh, north northwest or even eastern Colorado. Um, so I wanted to bring that up as an option to see if people and and Leah still is uh, going to be sending me more information around the costs and um, and what would be involved in that. And I think she said we have up until January to if people are interested in pursuing or looking at this as a as a viable option that. We could, you know, have some more serious conversations about it. I wanted to get people's comments on the phone to see if is pursuing vistas, a cohort of vistas that focus on marketing communications, understanding the best practices for, for really, um, for lack of a better word, selling mentoring, um, and using them with agencies, is that of interest um, to to other organizations? And Michaela, feel free to jump in if I've butchered some of it. No, that is a great introduction. Thanks. Has anyone used Vistas in this role before? No. Yet. Yeah. I've had Vistas. This is Tina Gunnison. They've been great in terms of capacity building, definitely. Um, every Vista we've had, <clears throat> we end up hiring. <laughs> so they stay a couple years past their commitment to us. Um, I guess I'm uh, wrapping my head around how we would share a VISTA in such a wide geographic region. Well, and it could be just individual agencies. I think if we start talking about a regional approach, it does get more complex. I think there's, there's different options on the table if people are interested in, in exploring them. And if not, that's okay too. Yeah, yeah. To second that comment, I, I, there's there's uh, Seth from SOS. Um, certainly a possibility. We'd need to be really specific in how to utilize them and what they could be moving forward. So, is there a campaign already in place that they could support with developing uh, across the region? Um, otherwise, it becomes difficult in managing with collaborative vista placements for clarity of of their role and for setting them up for success and, and moving forward. Yeah, yeah, I think the collaboration piece will be tough. I wonder even if people are interested, if 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 it was just for a first year is piloting it with four or five agencies, because it's with through CRC, you don't have a have to have a minimum number and you are applying to CRC, not to to um, the CNCS, the Corporation for National and Community Service, you're not applying to them for the VISTAs, you're just seeing if you can get one through CRC. Um, and I think for us, you know, if there was one VISTA, Mentor Colorado wouldn't really need to be involved, but if there were three or four or five, and we said, wait, Mentor Colorado can support in, in assisting these VISTAs and understanding what's happening in other states and what are some of the best practices and Let's pull together these marketing experts. That's that's where we see we could potentially play a role, but it really is up to the individual agency to decide: it, would this support me in my uh, marketing communications and fundraising efforts? I think one thing that got me excited um, in our conversation last week, this is Michaela, sorry, um, is the thought of having a cohort and specifically training them on mentoring strategies and best practices um, and understanding the field a bit more um, and then possibly working together. Um, so if they are spread out in agencies throughout um, the rural part of the state, um, being able to communicate and have more of a, a collective message and force that people start to recognize. So it, to me, it felt like it bridged a little bit of that, um, everyone working on their own and trying to build their own um, campaigns.
Yeah, and I guess the other option too is instead of placing them at agencies, if people are interested in Vistas, we could say, um, say we have 12 agencies on the phone and Mentor Colorado covers a portion of those costs related to the Vista and the mentoring agencies in rural Colorado cover you know, a certain percentage of the cost and we get two Vistas and they focus on dressing one or two or three of these areas or wherever people find that priority. That's another approach that could be taken if we're looking for more capacity to further further the rural rural agenda. Well, what I can do too is I, I can leave it with people. If you are interested, I will include the link to the CRC uh, VISTA program. If you individually are interested in a VISTA member, please know that there's an option, not just for marketing, communications, and fundraising, but for other areas that you want capacity building support. Um, they're different than the AmeriCorps in that they don't provide direct service to your beneficiaries. Um, so if you are interested in receiving a VISTA member, you can use that link. If you think there's a wider opportunity here for, for us to work together with VISTAs, uh, feel free to email me and let me know. Yeah, I look at, um, Brad, I mean, are, are there any opportunities that you're seeing that, like, that are more like larger funding potentials that a VISTA would be a good person to work through. And I think about some of the relationships that are in the mentoring or that are in the metro areas with larger partnerships with professional sports. I mean, is there something that we could work through similarly in rural to support rural mentoring programs? And those would be the types of roles that VISTAs uh, I, I think could, could, be good because none of us on the call would have the the capacity to move forward on headway. Some of these challenges that that I'm trying to work through on the fundraising specifically is without something like that of a, a, a new or different fundraising stream, it it becomes really difficult because to, for a Vista to maintain that collaborative focus um, when they're working at with there, there's not a new stream that they're looking at and they're just looking at, you know, how to grow what's already there with existing agencies. So it puts them in a challenging situation. Yeah. Yeah. And I think like for us, our challenge for Metro Colorado is there's lots of things going on at a national level with Nike, with LinkedIn, with different campaigns that they're doing. And even this month, they just started thank your mentor where, you know, federal legislators are holding up signs and say, thank your mentor. I would love to have, support to bring those campaigns to Colorado, but I don't, the return on investment is going to be long-term and there's not going to be a direct impact on rural agencies with some of those campaigns that, that Mentor Colorado is looking at. We know that we need to create a movement <clears throat> to have larger presence. When I think of how can we directly impact your organization, I actually think, well, if we got a VISTA member that researched grants for you, looked at block grant funding for rural agencies, tapped into it, looked at all the best practices and fundraisings, also connected with state legislators, like all the things that I would love to have time to do but don't have a budget for. So if we had a VISTA member providing all of that support so that these quarterly meetings are rich, full of, full of lots of great information, but also they're, they're saying, here's these 10 grants we think agencies should apply for. Here's five grants we think we should do block funding for. Here And... I think then a VISTA member would have a direct impact on your organization. Um, but I didn't know if anyone had another idea. That's so another possibility is for Metro Colorado to apply for a VISTA and support your agencies in that way. And that we just have one or two that, that provide assistance to you. Uh, and their focus is on rural Colorado. And ideally, they'd be placed in rural Colorado as well. So something for us to think about. I don't know, Seth, did that answer what you? Yeah, no. I mean, that certainly does. I mean, how you approached it, that that, that is a good approach to it. I mean, of, of of having that opportunity to focus and research is a really good approach to it and a good way to look at it. Okay. Well, what I'm going to do, I'm going to follow up with CRC and see about the possibility of Mentor Colorado getting a Vista to support uh, mentoring in rural Colorado. And uh, if if that gets to a more serious conversation, then I'll I'll make sure I'm reaching out to all of the agencies uh, in rural Colorado to get your input on what should that look like. What is that member going to? Be, what's the what's going to have the biggest impact on your agency if that Vista member is doing this? We also have the option 
uh, Mentor Colorado, because we're under the Colorado Nonprofit Development Center, is to get a VISTA through them. Um, and that might be a lot less hoops for us to jump through. So that's a, that's a possibility for us as well. And uh, I'll make sure on these quarterly calls, and especially I know there's advisory council members on this call, that I keep you updated on where we are with the, the uh, VISTA support. But if you want to know more, I'll send you the link. And if you're interested for your individual agency, make sure you reach out to them um, in the next month. Okay, the other topic that um, CRC had mentioned was they thought that would be a good return on investment for Rent Mentor Colorado to consider applying for block funding for rural agencies. And that individually it was hard for smaller organizations to access larger and national grants, but through collaborative grants that, you know, that might have a greater impact if we were to say, you know, where, where should we spend our time? Um, you know, I, I think I'd mentioned in the last call, we are looking at the OJJDP funds. Multiple states have signed on to look at ways because for most of OJJDP, and this year it was at 80 million, they dropped it from 90 million last year. Most of those funds just go to larger agencies, 4-H, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, um, Boys and Girls Clubs. There's been a movement about trying to get OJJDP to also distribute those funds to mentoring partnerships like Mentor Colorado. And then we redistribute it to rural agencies. Um, so that's one thing we're, we're looking at and we're seeing is, is there a possibility. But in terms of other block funding uh, agencies, I don't know if anyone, and I know Partners is on the call, and Partners also does a little bit of this. Would Do people see that as something that's beneficial, not, not tapping into existing funding sources that you're already getting, but looking at funding sources that you can't get and seeing if there is a collaborative grant that we could create for rural agencies in Colorado? Yes. <laughs> I, I love that idea. <laughs> you know, we have, you're right, Partners has twice now um, come together um, as an association, uh, wrote that very behemoth application, jumped through all the hoops. Um, it's just a lot of work for, um, you know, it's great risk, great benefit if you get it. Um, it just seems like it's really hard to get. Um, so sharing the effort reduces the risk, you know, of, hey, I spent all this time with this and maybe I should have been taking out, you know, a local donor to lunch. Um, I mean, that's really, that's kind of what my board yeah. looks at, you know, um, where was the return on the investment? Um, but anyway, I think, yeah, whatever role uh, we could, you know, I think it would still be work because it's still, everyone has to play their part. But um, if Mentor Colorado has a way to ease that burden, um, I, I would certainly yeah, I, see about With the OJJDP, what comes to mind for me is that um, um, four, I think, of the partners affiliates applied together because <clears throat> there was a limit um, according to their instructions on how many separate agencies could work together. So I don't know, Brad, if that would affect um, that, that OJJDP um, block funding should Mentor Colorado be interested? <clears throat> I think they, what was it, Michelle? Only five, they, they only allowed five. five. It was, yeah. it was five out of the seven of us. So right. Right. Know, that right. was a delicate conversation about which five. Um, in the end, it, you know, sort of made sense who, who moved forward. Um, but it, what was frustrating is, is you know, I would, I would like to say, oh, well, if you're Mentor Colorado, is that one, like, could that be one? <laughs> But they wouldn't let PMA can be considered one. Um, no. And yet when you look at who was actually funded, those agencies definitely had multiple arms underneath them of like locate, you know. So um, it's interesting. I think, yeah, Tina brings up a good point. Although there was different ways we could have applied. So I, I was really only familiar with that um, one collaborative um, multi-state is another scenario. Um, obviously, Friends First is very familiar with with OJJDP, and I think they get it through a multi-state application. Yeah, and I think for us, we weren't looking at trying to say, how do we fit within these rules? We were looking at, how do we change the rules? 
Oh, so, that's wow. better. Hey, we like that. Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's that's a slow conversation, and I think the challenge we 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 ran into this year was it got dropped by ten million, and so us trying to piece out a new way to support rural agencies with OJJDP, it was only going to come if there was an increase in OJJDP. So we were asking 120 million this year on a federal level and with all of our mentoring partnerships and advocacy efforts. Um, and we knew that creating a new structure or creating a new bucket for rural agencies isn't going to happen from taking it from existing funding because that just doesn't make anybody happy. And we need to have a unified approach. So what we were looking at is if we could get more money into OJJDP, the additional funds that we're requesting would go to rural agencies throughout the U.S. Um, so until we get additional funding under OJJDP, I think it's going to be a bit of a long shot. But I just wanted to say, like, you know, that's one example of the block funding. We also do it with Serve Colorado, and meant we we have applied for the AmeriCorps program for multiple agencies that were interested in receiving AmeriCorps. Um, so you know, Mentor Colorado is happy to go into this area. I think if, if there is a return on investment and, you know, to your point, Michelle, when, when we can share the risk and share the share the load and work on things together. So, um, you know, I think our, our step is to identify grants. And I don't know if anyone off the top of their head has grants that that they've looked at and said, we we don't apply or this is too large for us. Um, has anyone had that in the that experience? OJJDP has been the big one on our end. I, I haven't seen others. I will say that I've been, um, I usually don't look very heavily into the health foundation ones, um, Colorado Health Trust, those ones, but um, I do feel like the momentum, and I, poor Brad has been hearing me talk about this, but the momentum around the ACE scores and the negative health outcomes from these adverse childhood experiences and the research that shows the best thing you can do to build resiliency against that ACE yeah, okay, is, is healthy relationships and, you know, the uh, self-regulation skills, which are the cornerstone of mentoring. Um, it just seems like I would be curious to see what funding out there from health initiatives, which I think there's a ton of money, would be interested in funding more preventative programming like mentoring. Yeah, I would add to that too, um, Ms. Michaela, that like in the um, prevention field, a lot of the, the research is really diving or digging down into the social and emotional learning and development, um, which is also supportive of the resiliency and healthy um, relationships and coping skills. So I think there's a tie in with both. Um, and I haven't looked either at the health foundation funding, but I think that's a good avenue. Well, this is Tina and I have tried applying for the Colorado Health Foundation and, um, and what I've been Told when I've been declined is that mentoring doesn't necessarily fit um, the the way they want to track programming. They they really uh, like curriculum. They like after school programs that meet for you know a certain period of time um, with the same kids for say an entire year on a daily basis. Um, so mentoring what they really aren't um, seeing how mentoring and the way we perform our services fits with how they attain their outcomes so maybe Brad that's a conversation you could start with them to educate them um, about mentoring and yeah how we do it and look at ways that it, maybe we can fit because that's really been the big, um, um, the, the reason that I've been declined in the past is that they, they, they just don't see how they can, how mentoring fits in with um, their current structure, basically. 
Well, from Mentor Colorado's perspective, we we just did a contract with Zim Consulting, and they did grant research for us, and they found I think it's a hundred grant opportunities, um, and they tiered them for us, and you know where they thought we should apply and where we wouldn't. But what I basically am in the process of now is reaching out to a lot of the foundations and grants because we we did this when we first started and we didn't have a lot of success. And I feel like if I can give them two or three options on the table and I can say, Mentor Colorado is doing this initiative, this initiative, or we're doing block funding with rural agencies, when they have an interest or an appetite for rural support, um, that's where I would like to say, we're also doing block funding for rural agencies, as long as it's not an organization that organ, uh, agencies are already receiving funding from, because we don't want to we don't want to take away from your existing funding. We want to make sure you're getting more funding than you already are, and we'd hate for them to ever say, "Well, I gave to this block funding, so I'm not going to give to you individually." But I would love to, as, as I'm reaching out to foundations, is to say, "Here's if you're interested in rural Colorado, we have a group that's now meeting to talk about how do we work together and how do we talk about." Um, growth and scale and quality in in rural communities. So I, I would just add that the sorry sorry the added um, piece of that conversation um, specific to rural is the lack um, to health you know the access issue to health um, services mental health physical right. health the hospitals were more rural it's you know that also is a um, just a key part of that conversation. Sorry, right. and the, talking. Yeah. the increased so, relevance of prevention um, in relation to, you know, health disparities. Well, and what I'd like this to is do Lindsay. is, sorry, go ahead, Lindsay. Oh, sorry, Brad. I was just going to say, too, that when I've looked into Colorado Health Foundation and, and some others, there are opportunities for me to start new programming and get a grant. But I feel like that is really hard, you know, for, for a lot of nonprofits to do. I need help with general operating and just keeping things going. And so I don't know if there's a way to weave that conversation in as well. Um, I don't know how others feel about that either. Well, Michelle, are you talking about new programming or are you talking about positioning existing programs? That wasn't Michelle talking. Oh, sorry. No, I was uh, based on Lindsay's question, Michelle. I was I was oh. going back to you, Michelle. When you were, when you were oh, talking I... about health outcomes, were you looking at revising your program model to align better with health outcomes, or were you saying no? We need to be positioning our existing community-based yes. mentoring program to show how it benefits health. Yes. Yes. And I think, you know, I wasn't going to go there because you know this is a call for like the rural and, um, but. I think it's much bigger than just rural is, is shared um, assessment because like Tina said, they don't like that they can't track, right? Like we, we report on attitudes and um, some behaviors, but mostly, you know, around that, um, it doesn't fit with them. Um, never mind how we, our service model, delivery model. So to answer your question shortly, Brad, I was saying, not. I don't want to redo what we do. I think our model works. I want to, um, and I, by the way, can't stand it when we try to chase the dollar. It's not about that. It's about uh, bridging that gap that they seem to have right now where they're not getting um, that if they want better health outcomes and they're not able to stop the ACEs from happening. I mean, I think there's organizations out there that that's their mission, right, is to reduce the experiences from even happening. But once that happens to a kiddo, what do you do? So that's the part I was saying is bridging that for, and that's I think through that advocacy piece, having a shared tool in which we measure some of those actual health outcomes or we even, you know, honestly trying to get funding to launch that kind of a study. How does mentoring affect health outcomes? Um, Boy, that would set the stage. Great. Um, so I, I'm just putting down some notes related to that because I think that could be a, you know, a, a, a full conversation in itself. And I think somebody like Mike Geringer at the national level, if people really want to talk about health outcomes or health com outcomes related to rural agencies, um, we could have Mike jump on one of these calls and talk to what is the research saying around health outcomes? What tools already exist 
related to health outcomes. Um, and I can shoot him a quick email just to see what he's already got and start uh, pulling that information together. So that's that's quick and easy for me to do. Um, any other comments about the block funding? I think um, for me, I'm happy to start pulling together some foundations, some grants that I think might be a good opportunity for us for block funding. Again, this, this won't work if it's just Mentor Colorado doing it. I would love for people on the call to also send me what they think are good grants for potential block funding. And then I'm happy at our next, next meeting to present on those grants that have been pulled together and the timeline associated with them. And we can see how people, how serious people are about, about doing shared collaborative grant opportunities. And the focus to me would be more on rural Colorado. And that could be towards a variety of different outcomes, whether it's health, health outcomes or academic or social emotional. I think what, what the case we'd be making is um, a, a greater need for support in rural Colorado, and that's why we're coming together. Um, but we would, you know, obviously need a, a team that would support this and uh, multiple people. But I think we can get started by just doing some brainstorming around grants. And so if people are interested in doing the block funding, I'll assume if you're sending me uh, ideas that you're interested in the block funding. If you aren't sending me any ideas, I'll assume that you're not interested in the block funding. How does that sound? Yeah, and I think Brad, with your with, with your approach to the block funding, it's it's a great one, and particularly in rural Colorado. I mean, it, it addresses the most significant challenge that 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 is for that exists for funders because the rural Colorado, it's it's there's so many different communities, and many of the programs are working in in uh, specific communities and so it becomes really hard for them to to understand who we are what we're doing the impacts we're having when they're trying to get involved across a massive geographic area and massive culturally diverse area and so how can we come together and i i really appreciated the comment about evaluations i mean how can we come together with uh uh targeted demonstration of impact through collective programs that meets what some of these funders are looking to give to, which then makes it easier for them to give into the rural communities and doing it through a, a block program that says, look, we'll take the burden off your case because Mentor Colorado will be the ones vetting these organizations on, on, on your behalf. Uh, to ensure that they meet these quality standards and are a part of these impacts that we're demonstrating to you. Yeah, and, I, and just to plug our work with the quality metric system, I think it's a real advantage of the quality metric system to say, you know, we, these organizations, and this is what we would want to include from Mentor Colorado's perspective in these block grants, we would want to include funds to allow organizations that haven't gone through the QMS to go through the quality metric system and receive that support so that it gives confidence in the funder that these are quality programs but it also allows mentor colorado to implement our qms and you know the majority of the dollars you know over 90 percent would be going to direct service into your operational funds but we would want to make sure that you know anyone that we're a pass through for funds that they're they're a quality program and so yeah i think you know we can come together around shared best practices and shared tools um, and similar demographics or challenges. Great. So I will, in my email, and, and if people are, uh, I know I've got a list beside me that I'm writing on action items. If people could write down, uh, your action item is to send me any uh, fund, any grants that you think would be valuable for us to consider. And I know with each grant, there's going to be different criteria and different focus, and that not everybody on the phone would fall under every grant. Um, but I think it, this just helps us get the conversation started. Okay. So um, one of the things I asked was um, I talked to um, Seth and to Tina about just talking a little bit about their organization, um, the overview of where they're getting their funds from, um, any successes they've experienced, what strategies are working in their communities, what they've learned from their fundraising experience, and any trends, um, I, I like the idea of taking one, two, three organizations every call and just having them talk a little bit about their fundraising. Uh, Seth and Tina are going to speak to one or more of these areas. Tina, Seth, no, no stress on, you know, 
on doing all of it, mm -hmm. but feel free to, to chime in on, on different areas. I know, Tina, you sent me a few, uh, just some information, and I actually threw it up on the slides. So I don't know if you want to get us started, Tina, and then, what Seth, what you could do is after Tina's talked about a specific area, if you could jump in and talk about that area as well, and I'll just kind of navigate it as it goes. But to start, maybe, Tina, can you give us a couple of minutes about your organization, and then, Seth, a couple of minutes about your organization? Sure. I, I think many of you are familiar with us just because, um, especially through Mentor Colorado, who's doing such a great job of connecting us all together. It's really appreciated. Thanks, Brad. We've been in Gunnison, serving Gunnison and um, Hinsdale counties since the, actually the 1980s. Um, we originated through the Juvenile Services Office. Um, in a program called Children's Champions. And that program ran for a few years in the 80s until um, there was a recognition that they, that they needed to have more structure around the mentoring program. So they started shopping for mentoring models and looked at several and decided on the Partners Mentoring Association model of structured mentoring and then became an affiliate of the Partners Mentoring Association in 1990. Um, so we've been around for a while. We originally started as um, with a mentoring mission um, and, and utilizing a traditional intentional community-based mentoring PMA accreditation standards um, model. And then um, um, like we had just discussed a few minutes ago, um, started needing additional funding and um, taking on, although mentoring remained the mission, we started taking on all kinds of other um, efforts that were definitely beneficial to youth and families, but were kind of peripheral to the mentoring mission. So there was program growth um, in those early years from the 90s through like 2006, but it was generally not in mentoring. It was in, you know, reaching out um, and developing programs um, that uh, brought us funding. So we were chasing the dollars for sure. In 2006, we have a board who was new, new and decided to really concentrate on our mentoring mission and, um, and drop some of those um, programs that um, um, were kind of peripheral to the mentoring vision and really concentrate on, on growing our mentoring piece. And I think that's been really beneficial for us. So in addition to community-based mentoring at that time, we started adding a variety of school-based mentoring strategies as well. So um, now we're doing, we have some school-based group mentoring, some school-based peer-to-peer, um, some kind of traditional school-based mentoring. We've got um, actual mentors in the schools who are considered behavioral technicians and um, and in addition to our community community based mentoring so that's where we are is that is that enough does anybody have any questions for me that's kind of our overview great no that's good seth do you want to talk a few minutes about sos outreach yeah, absolutely. Uh, so SOS, uh, we started as a organization uh, that, that uh, was introducing youth to, to skiing and snowboarding, uh, well, snowboarding originally, and so not with the uh, intention on mentoring. Uh, what happened as we began introducing pro programs and tying in with uh, adult volunteers and the core value curriculum was that the the participants were graduating from an introductory program and they were asking what's next and that's where we then developed in late 90s early 2000s a mentoring program that provided and, and now fully developed it's a an a eight plus year curriculum um, starting with youth and uh, as young as age eight and our goal is uh, through 18 um, to capture them starts with an introduction with into the outdoors and core values and then moves into uh, a mentoring program that incorporates outdoors service learning leadership development uh, and, and an adult mentor 
And then as uh, kids graduate from that mentoring program at 15 or 16 years old, they're then uh, empowered to return as junior mentors. And so through high school graduation and that sophomore, junior, senior year, they're returning to kids who are just starting in the mentoring program to, to uh, provide the program back to them. So it's, it's leveraging outdoor activity throughout. And uh, one of the core components for SOS is that we're in uh, communities um, and our engagement is through schools and youth agencies. And so that's where our recruitment comes in. Uh, many of those are local schools, uh, and there's also a number of existing mentoring programs who then uh, partner with SOS and, and adopt uh, and integrate within a lot of our curriculum. And so it, it is in that partnership with schools and youth agencies that we've been successful in implementing our, our program, but also in expanding our impacts. Great. Thanks, Seth. And I just threw up, I don't know if people still see my screen. I just threw up your website to have so people could see where to reach out to you. Um, so what we were hoping to talk about is the the different revenue streams, so people can get a sense of where revenue is coming from for these agencies. Mm -hmm. um, I've got Tina's up here, but then after Tina talks about this, uh, Beth, I'll get you to, to talk a little bit about what your breakdown looks like. Tina, do you want to walk through this breakdown just generally? Sure, and I, you know, anybody can jump in at any time because. Uh, what I find is that this varies year to year, and this is just what we look like this this particular year. Um, so when we, when we look at contributions, we're looking at everything that comes in um, from individuals and local businesses, and this year it's about 17% um, of our budget. Special events are something that we, we do a couple of special events. Um, we find that in a valley with over 100 nonprofits. There are so many special events, particularly in the summer when the second homeowners are in town, that um, trying to compete with um, all of those, um, uh, you know, fundraising activities, keeping ours to just a couple that we think are really valuable um, is helpful. So we don't do a ton of special events. We just have two big ones. Um, Foundation support this year is at about 12%. In general, it, again, you guys are all familiar with this. Um, depending on the cycles of the of the um, funders that we're on, you know, one year on, two years off, two years on, one year off, once every three years. You know, some years we'll have a higher amount of foundation support than others, and and this year is one of our lower years. We generally see more foundation support than we did this year. We're just off cycle for a lot of those funders. Um, government support is something that we work really hard to keep in balance because it's so easy to depend on that. And truly, our government support is our bread and butter because um, funding from from anybody who can give us money for you know a, a five-year commitment or a three-year commitment is definitely beneficial to our sustainability. And um, it's easy to get sucked in, I think, to the um, government funding piece as especially if you're rural, um, as, um, as the biggest part of your budget. And when that goes away, you go away. So working on developing those diversified funding streams is, is, is really important. When you're in rural areas where, you know, the, the government funding is typically what you can get the most out of, but that's about 33% of our budget. I can say that back in 2000, prior to 2006, government funding was probably 90% of our budget. So we've worked really hard to bring that down. And then we consider our in-kind volunteer support, which is the actual number of hours that volunteer mentors contribute. Um, we consider that as part of our budget, and that's about 33%. So while it's not actual dollars, um, funders like to see that sort of and level of community involvement. Great, thanks, Tina. Did anyone have any questions for Tina about the breakdown? And Seth, do you want to comment on how yours either looks similar or different? Yeah, I'll say the 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 big. So we do not have uh, government support. Uh, we have a, a couple of small uh, smaller 
local um, a applications that we submit to, to town governments. Um, however, on a large scale, that's the biggest difference is the government support. Otherwise, a, a relatively even spread on the individual donors, foundation support, and same thing, uh, less of a prioritization on special events. Uh, and then in kind is is a big leverage point for us of, of being able to leverage what we're securing from the outdoor industry uh, against our budget. Great, yeah, and I'm guessing uh, is that like um, the ski resorts providing in kind support? Yeah, jackets, pants, goggles, gloves, hats, uh, lift tickets, rental equipment, instruction. Uh, we're uh, it was about three to one, so three dollars of in kind to one dollar of cash. Uh, in the most recent audited year, and, and that's before looking at time, but just of what we're receiving for goods and services direct to programs. Wow. Yeah, that's a lot of uh, support. I don't know. Did anyone else want to comment on percentages or what, what they're receiving or questions they had? I had a question on the in-kind. Do you guys um, include that in all your budgets? So... You know, it's in your financials, it's in your QuickBook reports, or is it, you know, how it, as an attachment it'll be, you know, your significant in kind or, you know, it's in your audit. Um, yeah, I've included in my budget, Michelle. Great, thanks. I'm curious, without that, um, does it change your percentages significantly? Yeah, it does, of course. Yeah. So I look at um, in-kind is included in financial statements, and then after the audit's completed, we then roll that back into QuickBooks as a single line item. However, in the budget, we look at the budget and present the budget just as cash um, so that we're looking at a, a, an apples-to-apples -apples comparison of, of the utilization of, of dollars that we're requesting against how they're actually going to be expended. Um, and presenting it not as those dollars, which it, it created some confusion when we tied in the in-kind into our budget presentation of how the dollars would be utilized. Gotcha. We do, we do the same as what you do. It gets rolled back in after the audit as a single line item of donated goods and services, but exactly. not throughout the... Okay, good to know here that there's two different ways and yep. they each work for you guys. Well, and particularly because some of the questions that happened when we did include it in the in the cash budget, um, because if we do not get cash funding, that in kind is not utilized, whether it's time or res resources that we're getting from that. I mean, if we can't run a program because we haven't fundraised it, and so it that projection within the budget can get a little skewed in some of the conversations when you have that in kind laid out as a part of your traditional cash uh, expenditures. Yeah, that makes sense. Good. Did anyone else have any other questions or comments around where funds are coming from, from some of the organizations? Okay. So, uh, our next was really like what's working in terms of fundraising. What have you learned? What's working? Tina pulled out together some notes. Uh, hopefully, I know Tina, you just sent me those as your notes, but I uh, hope you don't mind me throwing right. them up on a slide. No, uh, I'm fine. So if you want to, Tina, do you want to speak a little bit to this? And then we'll have uh, Seth, you can jump in after and talk a little bit about what you find is working in your community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, and again, I, I think that we all understand the value of diversifying our fund, funding streams um, and all kinds of reasons for that. Um, I, we serve, we live in a community with um, a high level of poverty and we understand that um, um, we're not going to get those huge donors that um, other uh, communities may be able to get. So. We really do concentrate, and I call it the Bernie Sanders style of, of contributions, but we encourage those smaller contributions. They make a big difference for us, um, and we get lots of those. So um, when we look at the pyramid of giving, we have some bigger donors for sure, um, but probably our significant donors, the level of giving is less than what many of you might consider a significant don donation. And most of our 
um, uh, fundraising efforts to individuals brings in those smaller dollar amounts, and I'm talking about um, $100 or less. Um, you know, I think what's been really beneficial for us, I, back, back in about, you know, prior to 2006, I think local fundraising brought in maybe less than 1% of our, of, our, of our budget. And the biggest difference in, um, in raising money locally really was in our board of directors making a commitment to becoming a fundraising board and then learning how to do that. So I think we've really become um, pretty formalized and sophisticated in training board members on how to ask and in, in how board members work towards um, their own goals and organizational goals in fundraising, how we break out individual responsibilities for board members to raise money, and just the clarity of um, when they join our board, they understand that their um, job is to raise money for us. Um, and I think that's probably been um, our biggest factor in, in local support, definitely. Okay. And it took a long time there. <laughs> Seth, did you want to add in some of the things that you're finding in your community? Well, I'll, I'll second. Um, uh, it was similar setup with individual donors. We have a lot of them and not a significant, uh, we, we do not have a strong significant or major gift program. Um, we've been uh, very proud of the, the number of donors that we've had and, and how we've been able to get people involved in the organization and that's we're looking at our volunteers and our mentors as as uh you know individuals who have the the capacity to give and if you give a lot of people giving a little bit to a mid-side amount it can add up quickly and so focusing on that has been a good base for us and to second that um when another component and touches on an earlier part of the conversation that that we've really recognized over the past year or two has been how important it is to have clarity of our programming and our impact and be able to really communicate that out. And that's to, to that answer of chasing funding or otherwise. Um, so many of the funders, if if when we're clear and when as we've really come to a strong understanding of, of our potential and our impact in the community, it, it then creates that that answer i mean the funders are not experts in what we do we're the experts and even hiring an evaluation person to come in they're not the experts on your program and and you have a lot of capacity to 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 speak with confidence about how your programs are structured and the the impact that they're having and in shifting uh, my mindset and the organization's mindset, it's really helped us in those conversations, whether it's with funders or with evaluation teams that come in of, of being able to take ownership for how we're structured and the impact we're having, and then getting the support for us to move forward around it. Great. And Seth, for you, in terms of fundraising, how much of your fundraising is a result of of uh, ski and snowboard community. Do a lot of funders come to you because they love skiing and snowboarding? Has that niche um, advanced your organization? It, it certainly has, yes. Uh, particularly on the individual donor side, uh, uh, the, we, we see some donors who are from outside of our communities However, they partake in the activities in our in in our communities, and so it's a good reset for them. And so they see 100% the impact that we have because of what it does in their personal lives. And so it creates a stronger connection with our individual donors, and that does extend into corporate and foundation donors because of the it's so clear for them how we're structured and the impact that we have because they have a similar relationship with their kids or they have a similar relationship with their family or they've mentored and had challenges with, with some mentoring relationships but then they see how they can do it through activity yeah it's an interesting conversation because i, I noticed some organizations focusing on certain niche groups like even impact 360 they do mentoring in squash and now they've expanded to expanded to mentoring and cycling because there are 
um, because they want their their students to be active, but also because they know there's communities that will mentor and will donate uh, within those demographics that love cycling or love squash. I don't know, has anyone else experienced anything of that? I don't know, Curtis, I know you're doing an arts program. Do you have a lot of artists that are are giving to the program as a result of that? Or does anyone else have um, any other strategies that they wanted to share that are working in their community? Yeah, our art program, well, some of our, we do have a few um, wealthier artists that do help fundraising, but it just opens the door to a whole new, you know, all the arts funding that, um, that you know, just mentoring you wouldn't have access to. And they like that. It's, I mean, it's a pretty unique program. I haven't heard of, I've heard of a couple others, but um, it just kind of opens the door to some new funders. Great. Thanks, Chris. Any, anyone else want to add what it, what's working in your community in terms of fundraising or how you're positioning your program? I would just say that we have had an increase, um, this is Michelle with Partners in Route, um, in our special events. Um, and it's actually making me a little bit nervous along with what Tina was saying when you don't want to become too heavy on government. Um, if these special events no longer chose us to be the beneficiary, um, it would definitely take a little while to recover from that. But it has been nice to, it's not our event per se, um, but we're a beneficiary of it. And of course, there is some work that goes along with it. And that's usually the question everyone asks when it comes to special events is, well, what's the, you know, the input that you have to give? Um, but just if anyone has events out there that already exist that have the potential for being a beneficiary type event or, um, you know, especially if there's something new coming to town, you know, I know for a while, like the Mad Mudders were new, um, and a lot of times they're looking to see how can they connect with a nonprofit. Um, we also had, so we have Steamboat Stinger, um, which is local bike race marathon, and then we have the Tour de Steamboat, which is a cycling race um, that give a lot of money to partners. And then recently when Winter Wondergrass came to town, um, we were able to make a connection with the organizer of that event, which is like a bluegrass music. Um, and uh, we're not a beneficiary of the event itself. However, we did get a, uh, we're able to do what we call Steamboat Unplugged, where it was a private home, private performance, um, trying to attract some of those as bigger individual donors, which is something we severely lack in our diversity funding, is we have a lot of small donors, but no no big ones. So, for whatever that's worth. Thanks, Michelle. I know. I, I think um, I think we're all looking for one of Lindsay's boogies. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's so true. That really is the golden grail of. <laughs> I know. It's a blessing and a curse. I know. It's no, really <laughs> fortunate. Um, I know. So we we have an event. This is Lindsay at the Buddy Program in Aspen, and our event was started about 19 years ago. So we definitely hear, you know, about the competition in the summer, um, and I've I've watched it and seen it get harder and harder. And we're really lucky. Our our event has kind of become a cornerstone of the summer, so it's it's still fairly popular. Um, but I've talked to several people in our area who do events and we're all struggling with seeing the really big funders are starting to fade away and they're fatigued from events and they're, um, they're not coming and, and we have a lot of eggs in that basket. So it's, it'll be really interesting to see how things evolve over the next couple of years and I'll definitely let you guys know if we uh, figure anything out in that regard. But we are very fortunate to have that event. What percent of your revenue comes from that event, Lindsay? Um, it's about a third of our revenue. Uh, 30 percent, I would say. Okay. Um, so it's big. It's big, and you know, a lot of times we don't qualify for grants because of that revenue, and we can't get anybody to give to us oh. because of, or because of that event, and they think that that event just carries us and it, it, we're very fortunate to have it, but it doesn't carry us and we need all of it. And so we're really working to diversify ourselves. 
Well, and, and one of the big things that we've seen uh, uh, as, as we've thought about events, and, and uh, Michelle, I appreciate your highlight of the, the tie-in and um, with the unplugged of where you to be able to tell that story and tie-in, and I'm not sure about the Boogies event if it's the same thing, but uh, of how important it is if you're if we're going to produce an event, it has to tell our story and really engage at a relational level. Um, that competition for events in Eagle County has just become massive, and it's no longer that you put on a good event and people are going to come just because it's a good event, because there's 37 other good events happening on the exact same day that people can choose to spend their event dollars on. So it's really important as we've been looking at events of how we can figure out, okay, is this something that's going to engage with our audience and 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 trip the lever for them to want to invite their friends and come out to? Otherwise, you know, our, our big one has been a bike event that has been on a steady decline for the past five years, and we have to figure out what do we do with it because producing a good bike bike event anymore, we're nearly losing money on it. Yeah. One well, and Lindsay, just to can you provide a little bit overview of your event? Is it's a gala? Is that correct? Yes, it's a gala event, and um, it's the silent auction, dinner, live auction, and a paddle raise. Um, and we see, and then we also have a race on the fourth of July, which is a much smaller event um, income wise, um, but they happen on the same week, so it's a nice time for us to kind of piggyback on the momentum of everything else happening around the fourth. But one area where we do struggle is getting our story told at that event. I feel like a lot of times people come for the party and for who's going to be there and they lose sight of what they're supporting. And and the other thing I see is that if people don't come to the event, they don't support us during, during the year. And that's been really frustrating too to, you know, and, and part of my job is to build that relationship with the organization, not with the party. So again, you know, it's, it's the pros and the cons that, um, all these things boil down to, but um, I think if, if anyone's thinking about starting an event from the ground up, really making it about your cause and not and the party, but but obviously the the cause is huge. And Lindsay, just you know, um, to speak to your event and many many fundraising events that I've attended to learn from, I think you do a really good job of getting your story out there. Oh, well, thank you, Tina. We try. We really, <laughs> really making the effort. So thank you. <laughs> and anyone is welcome to come and join us at the event. Tina comes and volunteers, and that's a great way to see it. If you're interested, uh, we'd love to have you in that capacity. So just, you know, as we continue these calls, we can keep talking about that, too. Great. Thanks, Lindsay. Uh, this Tina, is a feel, feel good note is at the Steam at Unplugged, our, the performer asked um, one of our board members, briefly about our program and you know what we do of course I'd already sent him stuff but he on the fly did a whole rap in front of everyone about oh, partners cool. mentoring and yeah it was amazing and I'm looking around being like please tell me someone's videoing this so I can. <laughs> um, but I will say you know yeah do I wish I had thought to ask him to do it um, yeah but I, I was just psyched that he did it and it did make me think of it you know how can we be more creative in getting the message out versus having a partnership talk have you know um so anyway for whatever again what that's worth well michelle if you don't mind could you do that rap for us right now oh yeah i would love to <laughs> <laughs> um, i'm more of a comedian than a musician okay well we'll get your stand up <laughs> we'll, we'll book you for the next call on a stand up piece um, I know, uh, Tina, you put together some of the lessons learned that you had. I don't know, Seth, if you already, if you have some as well, but do you want to talk a little bit to this, Tina? Sure. And a lot of it we've already said, you know, no two years are ever alike. Um, and I am, I, I think one of the great things about being smaller and being rural is that it opens up opportunities for me to apply for funding sort of on the fly. So when special opportunities come up that maybe, um, for example, a couple of years years ago with marijuana excise sales tax dollars, um, our, it, we don't have a huge um, um, system of approvals so, so that um, I can jump in and apply for funding when the turnaround's really 
short. Um, and so I'm always able to take advantage of that kind of stuff. So uh, that that's kind of great. Um, um, you know, again, the, the board involvement and the understanding of the board as a fundraising board has really been crucial and key. Um, I can tell you that in the early years when I was finding my feet as an executive director, I was really reluctant to hand off any fundraising responsibilities to my staff, and there were several reasons for that. But over the years, as we've all worked together, um, they've been, their connections help in the fundraising piece in a lot of different ways, and um, I've become more comfortable with them doing that. And so um, I would, I would, recommend that you bring staff on board to help with fundraising um, if you're one of those people like me who wasn't really sure if that would should be their role but they've been super helpful um, and just being flexible you know like I said with um, what's open and available in terms of what you can apply for so um, that you don't miss opportunities talking to this group listening to what everybody else does. Um, I love the ideas that we're coming up with in terms of collaborative funding. Um, all of that stuff, I think, leads somewhere, and we need to stay open to that. And then, you know, learning from others, you know, go, go to Lindsay's fundraiser. Michelle, I'd love to come to one of yours and help out. I, I did that with Chafee County Mentors, and they came here to our event. Um, I call it stealing ideas. I can't do everything the way all of you do it in your communities. We all know our communities, you know, on a personal level and what works, but I can definitely take ideas from, from your events and your fundraising strategies and adapt them to my own community. And that's been beneficial for me for sure. Great. Thanks, Tina. Seth, is there anything you'd like to add? Second on the flexibility and the the, the learning. Uh, I mean, talk to as many people as you can. Um, our peer organizations, larger organizations, smaller organizations. I mean, whoever else is out there um, to learn from, and then get as many people on board, um, starting within the organization, and then to the board, and then to your community, and and determine. You know, we've been working through of how we can have more advocates, uh, so outside of staff and board, and we're still working on developing that plan, but um, really see that as a, a good potential for us in the fundraising. So how can we have people who are really excited about what they contribute to SOS and, and to empower them to share how others can get involved? Uh, so it's a, a strategy that we're just starting to work down, but um, yeah, more people involved and the more you can um, train others in those big relationships, it just strengthens them. Great, thanks. And I don't know, Tina, uh, Seth, if there's anything else you wanted to add. I know I'd, I'd ask you a number of different questions, but was there anything else that uh, I'd left out? I don't think so, uh, Brad. Yeah. <laughs> I'd second that. <laughs> okay, great. Well, thank you. Uh, I don't know. I mean, if anybody has any questions, let us know. I, I yeah. Yeah, and uh, you know, for me, it is more of a discussion, and I really appreciate Tina and Seth uh, kind of going it over because I think uh, you know everybody's everybody's learning and everybody's an expert. I feel like at the same time, and so it's great to hear what other organizations are doing. And thanks for being our our kind of guinea pigs and going first and talking a little bit about what fundraising looks like and what you've learned from. Did anyone have any questions for Seth or Tina or, or anything about the, the lessons learned that they want to add? So what we can do, um, oh, and also Tina, you had these tips and I don't know if you've already gone through all of them. I think pretty much we've identified all of them. I just put together a tip sheet I thought might be helpful for some of you. So feel free, I'll, again, I'll be sending this PowerPoint, so if people want to refer back to it and see what, what people had said, uh, the lists are there. The, the last thing I was hoping we could talk to, we touched on it at the last call, and I just uh, asked Michelle and Lindsay to, to provide a brief explanation, was the local tax. 
Um, Michelle, do you want to spend about two or three minutes uh, just talking, and this is our last uh, agenda item, just to talk a couple minutes about the local tax and how it was created in Steamboat? Sorry, I was muted. Um, yeah, it, it's pretty much what's on the screen that um, we have a half cent sales tax, which is only in the city of Steamboat Springs, so it does not, um, that tax is not collected countywide. Um, and the, the language around the um, legislation getting that passed was to a, a very broad and vague uh, educational uh, purpose. So um, I can tell you, having been here in 2000 and um, or 1993 when it started, um, is that it was very specific at the time to help with the technology um, budget, which was non-existent at the Steamboat School District, and additionally with classroom sizes, that there was population growth and um, there was just too many students per teacher um, and per classroom. So um, they started collecting that money and um, and they have to go get a chair. Mine broke. Sorry, my bookkeeper just walked in. <laughs> so um, the um, the result of the tax was that um, the schools would apply because it's essentially uh, a tax that goes to a granting board that is. Um, you know how are they figure? I don't even know how that board is figured out. Um, I know they apply, but I think there's just, there was, from that original group that started it, um, they just have always, you know, recruited new members, but they're not appointed by anyone. They're not elected. Um, it's like a foundation, pretty much. That being said, partners um, through the school-based mentoring specifically, so not the community-based program, but the school-based mentoring um, is able to apply for those funds. Um, we are a part of a small group of community organizations that apply for those funds because we meet the educational um, purpose. Um, so yeah, um, in 2009 they did allow the other two school districts in the area. Basically families were saying, hey, we spend all our money in Steamboat, so that sales tax you're getting is off of our backs, not just the tourists and the local Steamboat people, and therefore our schools should also get the benefit of this tax. And um, of course it was a tax that was being voted on by Steamboat people, so I think the initial thought was, was they weren't going to share the money with the rural people, but enough um, employers recognize that their employees live outside the city of Steamboat, as do um, many people do. And so um, I think that was kind of an overwhelming uh, campaign to make sure that it was shared across uh, the whole county to a less degree, I will say. Um, the South Route and uh, West Route Hayden areas do not get, Steamboat still gets the lion's share by far. Um, in the community organizations, um, there used to be only three of us. I think there's now 12. So the pot, the water hole has not gotten any bigger, but now the whole safari comes to the water hole. So that has been a little challenging for the school-based mentoring story. Um, we're only 3% of whatever it is, close to $3 million, but only 3% go to community organizations. And so Michelle sent me the breakdown of who is getting funds from this. Um, I'm assuming it's also on the link um, because it's a government distribution of funds. I'm guessing it's very transparent. Is that $4 yes. million, Michelle, that was budgeted for? Oh yeah, four. Okay, so you know, it's significant yeah. in terms of the, the tax and what they're able to bring in. And that's on an annual basis, they're giving out $4 million? Yes. Yeah. So, you know, if, if, if organizations are looking at in their county, in their cities, or in their towns to, especially if you have ski towns, is to promote a local tax, um, you know, there's, there's examples of this. And the other one is in Pitkin County. Lindsay, do you want to talk for a minute about Pitkin County? Sure. So, um, the, it's the Healthy Community Fund is the name of it, and it's in Picking County, and Picking County is where Aspen and Snowmass are located. So there's um, 
a lot of money coming through there. It's a property tax, um, and it started in 2002. It was renewed in 2006, and then again in 2011. So it's had strong support for over, well, it's going on 15 years. Um, it's not just for educational programs. It's for any um, healthy uh, health and human service organization. And we've actually seen our, um, we have to apply for a grant um, every three years. We have a three-year partnership grant through this fund, um, and we've been able to increase the amount of funding that we've been getting um, because of our growth and the more that we're doing, um, and because the fund has stayed pretty robust. So we're really fortunate to have it. I will say um, it was the vision of our um, Health and Human Services Director in Picking County who, who started this, and um, well. it's a huge source of revenue for the buddy program. I mean, small percentage wise, but I think it shows a lot of support from the county and then we're able to leverage it when we go to Garfield County or Eagle County and then also the municipalities. Great, did anyone have any questions about the local tax? For Michelle or Lindsay? And I guess, you know, I'm always surprised at how advocacy works and that it actually works, like there's results and that we can get increased funding if we just spend time building those relationships and, and making the ask. Um, to me, this is a really fascinating area to see, is there uh, a local tax that could be created in more communities? Um, and I don't know if anyone's already thinking about this or starting that conversation with, with other agencies in their communities. But uh, we well, do. Uh, one, Brad, you highlight one of the most significant advantages to these communities is that our access is is strong, and if we can come together with a uh, unified voice and approach, you, you can get somewhere. It may not be where you originally intended, but you there are a lot of avenues to approach, whether it's through government and taxing or other initiatives that that you could. Uh, get into and and I mean that's the advantage to being in these rural communities. Yeah, yeah, because I think it'd be hard to do this in Denver, but um, in smaller communities where you have those relationships or it's easier to build those relationships, um, it mm -hmm. seems more possible for these local tax. Yeah. Um, I know our time is running out or has run out. Um, so I, what I'll do is I'm gonna I have a uh, action items and follow up. I'm going to plan our next meeting for three months from now. Uh, that doesn't mean we still can't talk and communicate regarding this. On your action items for people sending block grants, um, please send me those ideas. In terms of Vista, if you're interested, I'm going to be sending you the link, or if you'd like to talk more about it with me, feel free to reach out. And I'm also going to be connecting with, uh, with Mike Geringer around the health outcomes and, I will, and tools that are available and see what research already exists and use that as a potential topic. So our next meeting will focus on the block grants, um, any results from the VISTA, and if there is a result from that, as well as the health outcomes. Is there anything else anyone would like to see in our next meeting? Uh, I, I'll think about it and let you know. Great. Yeah, just shoot me ideas. If, and if people are interested in presenting or they, they have an event or they've done something that they feel like is working in their community and are happy to share it with the group, uh, please let me know. Because uh, it would just be great if people you know, pulled together what, what is working and said, here, try this, or here's some other ideas, just to stimulate the conversation and make sure that we are tapping into what's working in other places. Good. Well, thanks everybody for joining on the call. I'll be sending a follow-up email later on today with some of the, the action items as well as the resources I mentioned. But if you do have any other ideas for our next meeting, please let me know. I'll shoot you a meeting invite probably later on today as well. Thanks again for joining. Okay, thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks.